I'll just do the important parts here. Um, we respectfully acknowledge that while we are living here in uh, Maine, we are not in the, we are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. While we cannot remake history, we learn from it and move forward with knowledge and respect. Part of that effort, in fact, four of our eight presentations from the summer lecture series relate to aspects of the Wabanaki history or culture. Building the Virginia celebrates the accomplishments of the Popham colony, but it also allows us to open a new, more positive chapter in the relationship between peoples of European and of Native American ancestry. We look forward to continued exploration of the world that we now share. Virginia and her home here at the Bath Freight Shed are the foundation for a variety of educational and community activities, all aimed at bringing to light the exciting and little known story of the Popham Colony. Our visitor center here, which is at the that end of the freight shed, for those of you who are wondering, this is our activities end, that's our exhibit end, um, is open Wednesday through Sunday from 10 to 3. And our docents are eager to share the history of the Popham Colony. Raise your hand if you're a docent here. You can do that if you're a virtual docent too, I'll acknowledge you. <laughs> Great, We've got four here in the audience and some abroad. Um, Sorry, I distracted myself. Um, we we'll look forward to explaining about the Popham Colony and how we went about building that beautiful ship out there. You can keep up with our activities on social media, Facebook and Instagram, and you can visit our website, which is rich with online exhibits um, at mfship.org. We encourage you to join our Mains First Ship community as a volunteer and or as a supporter. From shipbuilding to community building, from academic research to fine art, our programs rely on the financial support of curious and compassionate businesses and individuals such as yourselves. Finally, a few housekeeping remarks. First of all, for those of you who are virtual, I'm Kirsty Truluck, the executive director. I apologize for being on mute at the start of this. <laughs> um, for our in-person guests, the head, which is the gender, neut gender neutral bathroom, is uh, on the other side of the screen. And Please silence your cell phones and note in case of fire that this building has exits all around um, on both sides and in the middle section and at each end. Finally, if you can't hear the speaker for any reason, please let us know either in the chat um, or just put your finger up and we'll, we'll fix it. And the same is for all, so it's true for all of you. Um, and now to introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to welcome Jim Parmentier, our organizer for tonight's and this summer's lecture. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Neil DiPaoli is a historian and a historical archaeologist who lives with his wife in Kittery, Maine. He earned his doctorate in history from the University of New Hampshire and since 2016 has been the historic site manager at Colonial Pemaquid State Historic Site on Maine's south central coast. This national historic landmark has prehistoric roots reaching back more than 6,000 years and historic prominence is one of New England's earliest fishing and trading settlements. Over the last 40 years, Dr. DePaul Pauli has studied English settlement and Anglo-Indian and English-French relations in nor early Northern New England. Tonight, Dr. Pauli, Paul, sorry, you're gonna it's have okay. to tell them what it is when I get done to Pauli, sorry. will tell us what it says right there. English and Wabanaki watercraft as tools of trade, diplomacy, communication and war in Midcoast, Maine, 1605 to 1700. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you. It's rather appropriate being here uh, this evening, considering the fact that we're right on the Kennebec and with a bevy of uh, reproduction uh, ships, boats, either here or close by, um, because so much of what I'm going to be talking about has something to do with that. Before I get going, there's a bunch of things I wanted to point out, but this is the only thing at this point, um, as far as material that's out there. Um, this is a video that came out in, I think, 2004. The title is Song of the Drum, The Petroglyphs of Maine. And this is a look at, it's about 47 minute video, and it's looking at petroglyphs, which essentially are picked or pecked um, images in uh, outcrops, typically up down east of uh, Maine. And they go back two, 3,000 years up to early contact, so in, as late as the 1700s and maybe 1800s. Um, so there is a connection there uh, and for a number of reasons, and they have a lot to do with uh, symbolism, shamanism within the Native American uh, 
world. And so there's been uh, work done on that. Mark Hedden, uh, who has done uh, quite a bit of work on this over the last 40, 50 years, I actually had the fortune to work with uh, Bruce Bork uh, in 1978 on North Haven, Vinyl Haven. And Mark was there and he's sort of the guy, the go-to guy when it comes to interpreting these things. So anyway, I'll pass this around. Uh, if you get a chance, I'm not sure if it's st still available, but it's really a great tool to really get some sense as to what, how the Native Americans, uh, both present and past, uh, viewed their world, uh, natural and uh, cultural. Okay. Let's see, is this going to agree with us here? Let me try it that way. Okay, so initially, what I want to do is talk a bit about the beginnings of everything. Um, and Maine presence in, uh, or Native American presence in Maine goes back upwards of 12 to 13,000 years. Uh, in the case of Midcoast Maine, you're probably talking about somewhere in the order of six to seven, maybe a little bit longer than that, uh, a thousand years ago. Um, in that, it was an area that was very attractive because of presence and uh, access to water. You had a fair amount of good farmland there, um, horticultural land at that point in time. Uh, and then of course, uh, marine life, uh, everything from porpoises to seals to uh, salmon, cod, and then on land, deer, moose, um, things along those lines. And these are things that were part of the Native American world for a long period of time. Once they come in contact with the French and English, things are put a bit out of whack. Um, and so we'll talk briefly about, or we'll, uh, talk about that a bit too. Anyway, um, Native Americans access to the mid coast uh, was gained through two resources, their legs and their watercraft. Um, and as far as we know, it's a little bit fuzzy, but um, the birch bark canoe was a pretty recent innovation within maybe the last 1,000, 1,500 years. Some say is uh, maybe only about six, 700 years ago. Um, and it will get into the advantages of having a birch bark canoe. Prior to that, you were using a dugout canoe, which is just what it sounds like. Uh, trees were felled and typically it was a lot more laborious process. You're going to fell them and then burn them, essentially uh, gouge out the innards of these tree trunks and form that into a canoe of one sort or another. A bit more cumbersome and a lot heavier than the birch bark canoes so that you're not going to be seeing folks typically, now I could be wrong in this, lugging those around uh, one person at a time or with two. Um, so that, that, again, is where the birch bark canoe plays a major role. And as I might have said uh, previously, there are some images um, of canoes in these petroglyphs that I just made reference to. And here we are, two of them with uh, four individuals, presumably with some kind of either poles, um, you'd be poling up the rapids or paddles of one for another, and then what that image that you see that's been cut off on the upper left hand is actually a moose that's been decapitated by me <laughs> for the image. Anyway, as I mentioned here, these were found in Machiasport and Emden, Maine, and they date somewhere between 500 to about 2000 years ago. And that's just my rough estimate. Now, who knows what lurks out there today because one of the things that's really challenging about making out these petroglyphs is depending on what time of the day you're looking at the rocks. Um, and that apparently was intended a part of the whole mystery of them. Uh, at, at, at sunny days, you're going to have a really rough time. But when the sun is coming down at a glancing angle, they really show out uh, pretty dramatically. I've looked a little bit over the years, my 47 years at Pemaquid, and haven't had any luck, but that does not mean I've exhausted everything. But I, if, I, if I found something like that, it would be intense. It would be intense to see something that is still there, that's been there for thousands of years. This gives you a little bit of feel for what the traditional Wabanaki food year, uh, how it proceeded from, <clears throat> excuse me, the late winter months, you know, January, December, February, and then early March. And then you're getting into early spring and then the time of plenty, the spring and summer uh, and early fall. 
winter is the toughest time it was for most everybody, but particularly for the Native Americans because of the heavy snows that often hit. And depending on how much there was, would determine how much game you were able to gain access to. What they're always trying to do is build for the future so that what you catch and collect berries, fish, you're drying for the thin months, the late months of, as I said, fall and winter. If not, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, even with that, there wasn't necessarily always enough. But the times were plenty were in, let's say, from May through um, September. And this is a great depiction um, at uh, the Cirque de Mont uh, Spring in Acadia National Park. Uh, I have not been up there, unfortunately, yet, but it gives you a pretty nice sort of image of not just the canoe itself, the birch bark canoe, but also sort of the family or band uh, spread that you see here. Everybody has a task. I uh, impress that upon, as do the rest of my staff at Colonial Pemaquid, when we uh, show them the fisherman's dwelling, that this was not a place where you could afford to have someone slack. Now, there were slackers, but when they did slack, they affected a lot of other people, whether you were a fisherman, uh, a guy by, uh, in the 1670s uh, was uh, involved in a court case, Richard Bedford, who uh, had a tendency to tip the bottle. He was the shoreman responsible for watching the cod as it was drying in the sun. And he passed out a few times. And I'm sure he got hell for that from his shipmates because basically that would have ruined that uh, catch of fish and their money in their pockets. Anyway, what we see here is not only the birch bark canoe on the shore then, but you see women at work and uh, stretching out and drying hides and presumably collecting shellfish and fish that they've caught, again, for the immediate present and for uh, what uh, the months that follow. This is uh, an image of a Penobscot birch bark canoe from the early uh, 1800s. And um, the materials are a little different from what you would have seen back in the 1600s and possibly earlier. Is anybody here familiar with Steve, Steve Kayard? Oh, great, good. Anyway, an amazing guy. He's not uh, indigenous, but he's worked with the indigenous community for about 40 years. I was fortunate enough to get in touch with him about uh, three or four years ago because I was hoping to at the time, it didn't happen. We came close, but no cigar. And I'm still hoping to snag him. Um, he's uh, been building birch bark canoes following the traditional methods um, that he's learned over the years on his own through, there's a, a bunch of, if people are curious, uh, amazing videos online. Some of them going back to the 1920s, 30s and 40s of Ojibwe, of uh, some uh, Wabnaki, um, and gives you a real sense as to what goes into making them. And this is a process that took a long period of time. And unfortunately, um, recent history, there's been a lot of loss of extensive loss of that knowledge within the indigenous community. But people like Steve Kayard have done much and others within the Native American uh, Penobscot, uh, uh, Passamaquoddy communities have been learning or relearning the, the craft. And so consequently, that's it's not lost forever, fortunately, and thanks too to some of these document documentaries that have come out. Um, what made the birch bark canoe so useful? It's light, it's relatively durable, and relatively easy to patch up. Now, that's not assuming that Jody, myself, or anybody else in the crowd here could go out and do that on their own, but um, if you were learning the had learned the ropes, you were able to do that. And you brought a kit with you, let's say with some birch bark, pine tar, um, charcoal to make the pitch and patch up a hole or and then, of course, spruce roots to to repair that uh, hole that may have been knocked out when you hit some rocks as you're in some rapids. But nonetheless, um, this was a huge innovation. Um, I had the fortune as a 14 and a half year old kid um, at a boys camp I went to in upstate New York um, to take part in a uh, eight day trip back. This would have been back in 1964 or five. 
and in the Algonquin uh, Provincial Car Park in Ontario. And um, we had aluminum canoes, a little bit different, but we had to portage anywhere from 200 yards to a mile and a quarter. And I was a little bit lighter than that, probably about 140 pounds, about five, seven. We varied between carrying canoes alone and they varied between 95 to 120 pounds to doubling up with someone and you had to carry your gear. And my shoulders were pretty damn sore after that experience, but it was really an eye opener between that and just the rapids and the whole bit. That's what they were doing. So Native Americans. Let's go here. Okay, this is just another example. These are, uh, I think, Maliseet here. A little bit different bow and stern. You can see they're rounded off, but the same basic design. Oops. Okay. This is what we see here. This came out of David Cook's on the gra in the gravel bar, which is an amazing book if you want to get a sense as to how complex this network of waterways that were being utilized by the indigenous folks, he's done it. And apparently he's still alive. He uh, wrote this book in 1979. I still have a copy of it. It's dog-eared, but boy, it's a huge, um, and it sort of got things going of the next generation that now are not only looking at through their own experiences canoeing on these waterways, but they're using satellite imagery to basically reconstruct and look at the changes that occurred from, let's say, the spring when the water's a lot higher and you're able to travel much more by water as opposed to the summertime when things are starting to dry out. And how many people here from Maine experience some dry Julys and Augusts? Um, well, there you go. Now you're more dependent on the bigger rivers uh, to travel and you're going to have to do more portaging. So that, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and they also had to have somebody carrying the cargo that they had. If they're a trader, there would have been several canoes, most likely, and several people that have been hauling that stuff. Their trade goods, the beaver and moose skin, or moose, uh, uh, yeah, beaver pelts, moose skins, otter, et cetera. But this gives, a, and this is a, a rendering of Dave's um, in, in his book. So if you uh, people are curious about some of these references I make to some of these books and you want to get sources, feel free to hit me up at This is Midcoast, Maine. Can anybody find the Pemaquid Peninsula? I hopefully see with that little hint there with the red sort of flattened out oval. That is just one of a number of uh, carrying points or portages. Can everybody see this fairly well here? Um, so as you can see, you had a number of crossovers. The one that is still pretty visible is the one where Fort William Henry or the forts as locals call it, um, still stands. And that was the end point from a portage from New Harbor so over on the east side of the Pemaquid Peninsula, they would carry their canoes from New Harbor um, over about two and a half miles to essentially just above the mouth of the Pemaquid River. And then they put their canoes back in. And this is something that would have gone on for thousands of years in one form or another, not carrying them if they had dugouts, but nonetheless. And better yet, who's been to Colonial Pemaquid or the forts? Does anybody remember that big glacial erratic or that big boulder that's inside the tower? People are always saying, why is the rock there? And I kind of got sick of telling them that. So I put up a panel explaining that. And it's helped, but we still get lots of people see why they're standing next to the panel. Why is the rock there? And yesterday I said, well, just take a look at the panel right over here. That'll explain it. Anyway, imagine you're canoeing from, let's say, Muscungus Bay. So essentially over here to uh, Sheepskit. And Native Americans had landmarks just the way we do today. Maybe Hojo's back in the olden days or... Uh, uh, anyway, I'm blanking out on some other good analogies, but 
this glacial erratic would have stood out like a sore thumb because you got no tower there. You have no buildings there as far as the, the English goes. Uh, and this is a mass of rock that would have, hey, we know that we are, let's say, uh, an hour paddle or whatever from sheepskin um, or the other way around. What I didn't mention and I should mention is why would they be portaging from New Harbor? Why not go around Pemico Point? Why? Oh, nothing to it. Come on. Good point. It is. And uh, not, not only for the ships that were, have been shipwrecked on a number of occasions, as Jody and others, can, I'm sure, can attest um, from the 1800s, and I'm sure some earlier than that. But we have some folks that don't quite get it there when it, they ignore the signs that say, do not go down on the rocks at this point have been washed over shore um, or out to sea on a number of occasions. So yes, you want to get around that point, but not canoeing through it. And the Native Americans were quite adept mariners because they were not only canoeing the inland waterways, but they also were sailing, canoeing, and fishing offshore, as Bruce Port discovered on Turner Farm on North Haven, uh, where they found things like swordfish uh, and other large fish um, that they were, cons they were catching and eating. So again, that sort of dispels this image that folks have of, you know, the primitive Native Americans, they didn't know what they're doing, and they're just you know, getting by. You know, the reality is a lot more, and they taught a lot of things to the English and French, as we'll see um, as we move along here. Anyway, um, I could go on about the portage points, but um, has anybody ever canoed uh, the Pemiquid River, Sheepskit River, and done any portaging, just out of curiosity? Any, anywhere beyond that? Okay. And how long a paddle was that for you? Okay, how long did that take you? Okay, yep. Yeah, but repeat that for the audience uh, and the virtual world. Yes, so the question I ask is how many here in the audience have done any canoeing outside of the Sheepskit Pemiquit area? And the answer was the Moose, yeah, Moose River. Moose River. Okay, so up, no okay, up north, great. Right. And those are a workout. Yes. Someone else is now mentioning Nicotawa's Pond. And is that somewhere you've been or? It's, um, and where is it? Yep. So he's mentioning a bunch of rivers uh, that are accessed. Yep. Yes. Thank you. And uh, to spin off of that, and I should keep moving on here. Um, if you want to get access to an amazing, I unfortunately didn't bring it tonight. Um, there's a map that is done by James Francis Sr who is Penobscot, um, and he is the, um, I'm going to mess up on this, the director or was of the uh, Penobscot uh, uh, Tribal Museum, uh, or historian, I'm sorry. Anyway, he put together over a number of years a map, both in Wabnaki and in English, of almost all of Maine, um, from the coast on up to the interior. And it is, it, it's a lot to digest, um, even though I've done a little bit of, of canoeing. Um, but it, it's really, and, and a lot of the old place names, uh, Wabnaki place names. So 
if again folks uh, want that access to that you can check that out or i'd be happy to you give me your email address um i could pass that info on to you it's really worth it along with a, a whole bunch of other stuff they have um language uh that you can learn on your own online um it's it's huge but anyway so what's quite apparent based on my comments and from the audience itself is that this was an, a complex and amazingly uh well-used and extensive system of movement in the interior and on the coast and it still exists today and another interesting point that uh i came across in reading uh, some other material is that indigenous folks were fairly proprietary to where they went and how they got there um for some obvious reasons not wanting that information to get in the wrong hands so it was you'll you'll hear accounts both english uh a guy by uh, i've forgotten his name now he was an english surveyor in 1760 is basically canoeing in the interior of maine and he's talking about going through these these cricks these the brambles and you know uh, making wrong turns um uh, as a result of this stuff is being passed on orally in one case, uh, it wasn't this particular incident, I don't think, uh, there were um, indigenous folks that were uh, coming down from Canada into Maine or the other way around, and they missed a turn. And what should have been a four day trip became a three to four week trip, and they almost died, you know, as a result of lot, you know, not having food, enough food to get. So it's not all fun and games, to, to put it mildly. But anyway, um, that, that, that's a very important element of this story. And this is one of my favorite spots. Um, this is the site of the old Pool Brothers up at Pemigewood Falls. I dug on, uh, let's see, well, we're gonna have to trust me. Yeah, that might help. Okay, thank you, so anyway. Falls, yep, thank you. Falls right here, okay. And you have the Great Falls, Lower Falls, and Lower Lower Falls. That's my, those are my terms. And then up here you have a, a series of dams that still remain from a number of the mills that operate here. Now that was a problem, not for the English, but it was for the Native Americans and for the fish. Um, both, uh, well, historically, we'll get into that a little bit later on. But nonetheless, this area, because you had these falls, was very attractive to Native Americans and English for different reasons and similar reasons. You come here in the springtime, and of course this isn't here. This is all fill, but this is very fertile land and particularly where we were digging over in here, it's a proper, well anyway, I won't tell you who it was, but um, uh, we found lots of artifacts, uh, projectile points, in other words, arrowheads, I even found a mudstone, uh, um, uh, uh, celt, uh, a grindstone. Um, so it's clear that they're producing crops, they're fishing, they're hunting deer, um, possibly some moose at this point, both probably this is going back about 5,000 years up to early contact again, probably the early 1600s. I remember talking with the current owner who's been there for ages. She's almost 90. Um, she, she remembered being told by her aunt that she had found some blue or turquoise glass beads. Now, those are trade beads. And that's indicating you're probably looking at uh, a goods that were uh, traded uh, for beaver pellets or moose um, by the Native Americans probably the early first decade or so of the 1600s. So when I heard that, I thought, wow. But of course, they're long gone, unfortunately. Anyway, this gives you sort of sets the table. So they're hanging out here, the Native Americans from let's say late March <clears throat> until probably again, September, fishing initially. So you're getting all the anadromous fish, salmon, shad, eels, um, alewives, et cetera, et cetera. Here are some of the artifacts that were found. This guy here is the most recent. This dates to probably around 1400 up to around 1600. Um, 
and we're looking at some chipping debris. This was used to uh, uh, debris left over from making tools, various tools. <clears throat> As you can see, the date here, uh, 400 AD, roughly to about 2500 BC, which again, about 5,000 years ago. And lo and behold, are we looking at a photograph from 5,000 years ago? No. This is a continuation of uh, a resumption of a Native American tradition of, in this case, they're after the, the fry of the eels. Um, and they've apparently been doing quite well. I was able to get out there in 2021 to see them at work a couple of times, once during the day and once at night. And these are the nets. And basically, they stake out their territory. So each individual has a spot from essentially the mouth of the Pemquid or the lower falls all the way up to uh, pretty much up to the Great Falls. Okay, the English seek a new world. Now we're getting into, we're beyond initial contact, but we're still getting folks that are kind of poking around. One most noticeable individual was a guy by the name of John Smith. Anybody heard of him? Um, he was quite a guy, uh, a bit of a ladies' man, a uh, BSer, a promoter, a warrior, et cetera, et cetera, all over the place, not just down in South Virginia, but up in North Virginia, a -A -A -K -A, Maine. Um, and this is, and I lied here, this is not 1614, this is a reproduction of the shallop that apparently he used down in Jamestown. But good enough. Uh, we have some other examples. A shallop can look like this. They can be either undecked or decked um, and have this lee board right here that keeps them on track. And Jeremy, do you want to help me out and uh, give a little bit more detail since you are the uh, one of the experts and Orman, of course, and Jim, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, nobody Hi, everyone. That. I'm Jeremy. Um, so we're talking about a shallop and and the image shows a lee board and we uh that's deployed down the side on the lee side when you're sailing to keep the boat from being pushed sideways in the water by the wind um what's that and well that's the truth this is <laughs> <laughs> that's the lee board for the small shallop i don't know if it shows up on the camera or not but... there we go um <laughs> So that our shallop is not at the dock. We had to pull it for the 4th of July parade before they closed off the street. Um, but yeah, so and that will be a chemical in the water this year. Uh -huh. Finally. So anyway. a, a more our more modern boat would have a center board right. down the center of the of the ship of the boat. Now you probably any sailors here that has that kind of setup. Okay, there you go. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> But John Smith in 1614, nice blank there, did set up shop on Monhegan, of which we can see right down here. Um, and he sailed over the six months he was there, sailed up and down the main coast. He is exploring. The English were a little late in the game. French had already started in the 1570s uh, as far as more serious exploration. Obviously, we have people earlier than that, 1524, Verrazano, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, John Cabot, 1497. Um, but as far as people being boots on the ground or in the water, however you want to look at it, John Smith um, traded with the Native Americans. He also did a fair amount of fishing, claims that he caught upwards of about 40,000 fish um, of various types, presumably cod and haddock and others. Uh, and this is what they were looking for, in part. Um, because this is supposedly equal to, and, and some, and again, you get a taken uh, account of the BS um, that's going there too. Because he, as I said, he's a promoter. Um, is comparable to what they're finding or better than what they're finding up in the Canadian Maritimes. Now, where are we today? Much different story due to 400 centuries of overfishing. But anyway, that's a whole nother kettle of fish, no pun intended. Um, so he really got things rolling, not only for fishing, but for interest in more resources, including not only fish, but timber. 
Timber. Why timber? Well, shipbuilding, but later on in time, it was used somewhat, probably locally, but the barrel stave business, those were, as they tell folks often, were the Rubbermaid containers of the day. You're shipping fish, wine, gunpowder, lead shot, nails, shoes, et cetera, et cetera, depending on whether it's red or white oak. So those babies are being cut in places like Maine or Monhegan, well, Monhegan, maybe not, but um, the region as a whole. And they're typically being, once we get these permit settlements, shipped broken down. Because why broken down as opposed to making the barrels here? Space. You can ship a lot more barrel staves than you can if you've had the barrels made. Anyway, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. So fish, timber, and furs. Furs being sort of the distant um, third item. Beaver, otter, uh, moose. So he does talk about that, but he's somewhat disappointed. He's disappointed, too, that he didn't see more Native Americans. And that may have had something to do with two things. One, the time of the year he was there. They're elsewhere, and to the reputation that the English are establishing slowly but surely, particularly the fishermen, are a rowdy lot and are not necessarily appreciative of the Native Americans. So that's, that's starting to put a uh, set in place. But this is the beginnings of one of two islands that become sort of the footprint for what becomes a permanent settlement about 10 years later, 12 years later, uh, on the Pemaco Peninsula. And the other of the duo is Damersco, right over here, about three miles offshore. I've had the fortune only once um, to get there. And uh, I was there back in the late 80s, hot summer day, and spent about five hours there just going berserk, getting pictures of, of the, the cellar holes. And I got a great shot of the footings to the fish stage from the 1600s at low tide it showed up anyway it's it's if you get a chance to get someone's get a boat and get out there it's well worth it so this as i said goes on for about 12 years um, Native Americans are still around the area, but something happens, unfortunately, uh, for Native, and this comes about as a result of contact with the English and French. A series of epidemics decimate the Native Americans all up and down the New England coast with a loss of 50 to 90 percent of the population. We can't, I, I can't speak for Maine in particular, I, excuse me, of, of mid-coast Maine, but it was dramatic. Imagine if the pandemic that we've been slogging through, and I've heard it maybe coming back again, or anyway, um, was 10, 20 times worse than it is today. What impact does that have on your political structure, your social structure, your religious leaders, and families? Huge. And that was a mess. Um, so it had a lot of negative consequences for Native Americans. There were survivors. And they continued to deal with these interlopers, but nonetheless, that's another part of the story. Um, at the same time, it made it easier for the English and French, to a certain degree, to pick over this land. Um, and so that was the beginning of what you know picks up steam in the in the 1600s. Uh, Pemaquid itself, I have a series of theories as far as where it started, but um, based in part on some uh, early accounts, 1624, and um, I think another one, I can't remember the sources now, but basically there's reference to a sh ship that made the shore in that general area harbor. They were, they were hanging out in this area. This was one of the uh, West Coast country um, ship merchants that was sending fishermen over. And on top of that, also, um, a long time ago in the 1870s, someone found a lead seal, a cloth seal, and those are typically a, attached to textiles, either identify the merchant that owned that seal and was selling it, or whether it's faulty or not, it's past muster, and, and on and on and on. The lead seal was four part, which is 17th century, um, and it had the date on it, 1610. 
Um, I've never seen it. Uh, when Helen Camp was still alive, who I started as a youngster on, under and along with other people, she was shown it by a local person that at that point had it. Um, and I've inquired and as often happens in fishing communities, stuff stays very private. So maybe someday, I'm not trying to get it. I just want to get a photograph of it. Anyway, so um, that said, you, you, I think where they actually set up shop on the mainland initially was New Harbor. Right here, because it was the area that they were most familiar with. Um, because it had been at that point, as I said, 12 to 14 years fishing offshore, but in the general vicinity. Uh, and you've got a cloth seal on there. That's kind of more than fishy, but anyway. Um, so within the next 60 years plus, um, let's say, well, to the 1680s, Pemaquid emerges. And where Colonial Pemaquid is today was the main hub. That was the commercial hub, um, the political hub. The Abraham Shirt managed that place for about 25 years. Um, that was a private entity, a private proprietorship. So it was not owned by the province of Maine, a separate and these two guys, um, Robert Allworth and Giles Elbridge. Robert was a senior, was a big wig. He was mayor of, of Bristol on two different occasions in the early 16 teens. He had a lot of connections overseas um, with Europe. Uh, going back to the 1590s, he actually was, I think, a trade factor on a voyage to Africa in 1599. And that voyage comes back with, among other things, two dozen elephant teeth it turns out we have a and i'm not saying that was this voyage but we have a yoruba ivory effigy um, that showed up at pemaquid um, was dug up in the late 1960s and i've had that several people uh, african oscar i've forgotten his last name who lives in portland and i had someone from bu anyway so there's some interesting other connections there with that said he's got it made He's got his trade network set up in Europe, in England, Ireland, et cetera. What he has to make the connection with is the new world. Um, he had the ships. He owned upwards of 10 ships in his career, which is very impressive. The three workhorses were the Charles, 240 tons, um, the Angel Gabriel of fame that, uh, where's Jim? Who for years was uh, tied in with some stories uh, indirectly, but anyway, and Orman uh, and, and uh, Jeremy. Um, and the uh, White Angel, which it turns out Plymouth owned in the late 1620s for a brief period of time. They'd sold it, but anyway, some interesting stories there. But So these ships are coming over, big armed, basically galleons um, that are capable of uh, weathering storms as opposed to a shallop, which... Would a deck shallop, let's say, of 20, 30 tons, how would they have fared sailing across the Atlantic in moderately, let's say, rough weather? Any one of you guys? Okay, if they're lucky. If they're lucky, there you go. If they're undecked, even worse, right? Yeah. Uh, why don't you, uh, <laughs> we're talking, we're making reference to Humphrey, Humphrey. Gilbert, yes, uh, and James Davies in 16, no, 15. okay, right, John Davies. John, 1580s, 1580s okay, right, so exploring in 20 ton pinnaces, of which we have a model right out here tied up on the Kennebec, so, Yes, you'd be risking your life and limb, but um, some people did do that. So um, these three that I made reference to are, are different kettle of fish. They're carrying passengers. I mean, a lot of passengers. We have some references there. Goods, livestock, as we know with the Angel Gabriel and also with the Charles. Um, and they're armed, typically, because they have to worry about pirates uh, leaving England. Um, Spanish pirates, French pirates, they're out there. Uh, something that you don't hear about much, but that is part of the, the equation. Um, in, in contrast to the birch bark canoe, 
But this is a, a 1715 print of a fishing stage and fishing operation in Newfoundland. And it gives you some idea as to what you would have seen all along uh, the central coast of Maine and Maine for uh, that matter, Pemaquid in particular, from Fish Point um, up to the mouth of the river and over in uh, New Harbor. Here's the stage. And here is a presumed shallop of one sort or another open undecked here, just filled with these sort of amorphous fish, presumably cod, that are being hoisted up with a pew onto the deck here. And this is a canvas tarp that's left part of this building open. This is where you are doing the bloody messy work of heading, gutting, and splitting the carcasses of these codfish, haddock, etc. And then down here, uh, they are being put on the flakes. And here they're being washed. Um, and you got here is a vat where the cod liver is breaking down and you're draining off the cod liver oil, which is a lubricant, a medicinal, and anything else, guys, that you can think of as far as cod liver oil back in the 1600s? Well, good enough. Anyway, for those two at least. So they all had a use. But you have a little problem. If that fish is not properly tended to, as our friend uh, John Bedford back in 1672 uh, wasn't on the job, you endanger your profit from that voyage. Um, it's usually, uh, let's see, skin up, in, or, uh, yeah, skin up in rainy weather and flesh up in sunny weather. And it's usually two days or so once they've been salted for them to be properly cured. Now cod can be good for upwards of two to three years. Now you wanna soak it before you eat it, but nonetheless, so it's nutritious and it will hold up for a long period of time. So that's what was going on at Pemaquid, Monhegan Dammer Scove with these shallops primarily. Um, they were the workhorses of the day. You're out there six days a week, 10 to 14 hours a day, busting your, you know what, uh, and by the time you're probably in your, and anybody can chime in on this one, probably in your early 30s, you're, you ain't uh, doing that kind of work. You may be a master of the ship or you have your own business. But uh, for me, it was genetics and archaeology did my back end. But anyway, not fishing. And this is the shallop that will be in the water in uh, about a month. Uh, at Pemaquid, assuming nothing happens weather-wise or whatnot for the first time, giving people a chance to see how it navigates. And again, undecked. And Jeremy, Jim, Orman, a ton or less? I know I've asked you this before and I've spaced it weight-wise. What would you say? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we'll... we'll, we'll Okay. Okay. So a light sucker, as opposed to the, some of the bigger guys that are decked and et cetera. Anyway, um, this also can not only be sailed, but rowed. And some folks that would experience that uh, or uh, will come on the 30th may get the opportunity to do that. Now, let's step aside for a minute here. English shallop, Portuguese chalupa, uh, French uh, I should know the French uh, term. Anyway, I'm blanking out. Lo and behold, our indigenous friends that we saw left in the dust for a minute there, they learned how to sail shallops pretty quickly. There is one incident, and I know there's more than this. The one I can think of is a uh, voyage uh, and an eyewitness account, and I've forgotten who makes this account, but 1605 is a, a Biscayan or the Bay of Biscay, so that either could have been French or Spanish, a Basque shallop. And it was manned by a indigenous crew. And not only that, but they had a moose, uh, a, a tribal totem on the sail. So that gives you some idea right there. This is pretty early. And um, you'll see and hear about this 
off and on, not so much with me, but in going on in the 17th century. We'll hear a little bit more later on in the 1670s when Pembroke, the late 1670s, was resettled about some sloops that had been captured uh, by the Native Americans and were held. They were selling them on some occasions. So they were, again, adept mariners and very adaptable. This is a pin, uh, yeah, a, a pinnace. Correct, guys, here. Uh, with a mizzen and a mainsail. And this was uh, decked, so a bit larger and better able to handle the weather. Um, a fishing boat, possibly, uh, in our neck of the woods that would have been used by the English. Now, with the English showing up and the French also, um, do you want to do the honors? This can be passed around uh, with the, the beaver pelt. And we have some, I brought some uh, goodies here. Um, okay. This is a beaver pelt, the real McCoy. Am I in the camera? I think so. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. And you can show the, the live audience. Um, beaver pelts were, as along with moose, uh, otter, and a variety of other mammals, were hunted, uh, trapped, shot, speared, etc., for thousands of years. So the beaver trade that takes off in the 1600s, particularly by the, let's say, mid-1600s and a little bit earlier, was not the first time. What happened and what changed was that the beaver now, and moose to a lesser degree, um, now had a commercial value. Native Americans, when they trapped all these guys, they were using them as the need arose, whether it's food, uh, clothing, uh, blankets to cover, or the wigwam, well, not so much wigwam, so, um, but with trade with the French and English, there now was a bigger market, so they are hunting more, and over time, two things happen. The beaver wars that some of you might have heard of that, that break out in the 1650s and 1660s break out in New York and spill over into New England itself. And this is a result of this tribes that are trying to squeeze out other tribes that are also trading for beaver, Iroquois in this case. Um, so you have a loss of life. You also have a loss of life of, uh, accelerated loss of life of the beaver. Uh, so consequently, they, they are not killed off, but the numbers are dramatically reduced um, as a result of this, this competition. What are the Native Americans getting for these items? And I brought just a little sample here that why don't we go with the smaller items first, the, the knife, the beads. <clears throat> Thanks. So this is a French Bergeron knife that was very popular, very well made. Oh, Right here, very sharp. You could use this to cut up your catch, or if you have somebody you don't get along with, give them a poke. Um, as a Native American, you oftentimes would be wearing this around your neck with beads on it. That we have an example of some legitimate, this is a reproduction, beads from around the 1700s, um, glass beads. So they have now replaced. You can pass that around. They've replaced Native American equivalent that were made out of shellfish and bone. So all the items, or virtually all the items I'm referring to are items that Native Americans had previously. But the night items that we see now are lighter, as in kettles are more durable, they're sharper, et cetera, et cetera. The other things work quite well for centuries, but you now have these items that you can acquire. Yes. This is a pretty amazing tool. It's a reproduction that was made by a friend of mine who is a really an amazing uh, craftsman. This is what's called a crooked knife. It was used as a woodworking tool. Now, if you look at it, they got it all wrong. We're cutting towards ourselves. How do we cut? The other way around. It worked. Um, they were embellished sometimes. Other times not, but these were used to make the ribs in a canoe, a birch bark canoe, to cut up the, the spruce roots that you're going to be stitching that 
canoe, the birch bark itself together with, and a variety of other items of the shaft to an arrow uh, that they're using. So this also can be passed away and don't rip off the price tag. <laughs> and why don't we just grab, uh, yeah, uh, that, that tinkling cone and the smoking pipe. Right. This, these are items that were intended for enjoyment or aesthetics. This is a very fancy, it's a reproduction of Sir Walter Raleigh effigy pipe, uh, sort of making fun of good old Sir Walter Raleigh. This would have dated uh, 1630s, 40s. Um, very good imitation. Um, pipes that the Native Americans were trading for were typically, as far as I know, were more mundane, not uh, as ornate as this one. Doesn't mean that they could have acquired one. But again, tobacco. Who had tobacco first, Native Americans or Europeans? Native Americans. Not exactly the same that we see coming out of Brazil or out of Virginia, but it was a form of tobacco. And this goes back uh, I, I'm guessing now a thousand, couple thousand years. Um, we actually found, or I found in the collections, a tip of a clay smoking pipe, Native American, indigenous. So, and I'm sure there's more. This guy here, very small item. Oops. Is a, where are we going? Why is the camera? Okay. Brass tinkling cone. It's conically shaped. And you would have been wearing this man or woman around your waist, uh, tied up with leather thongs. Um, it's an ornamentation. These normally would have been a golden hue. This has been patented because it had been in ground for a long time. This was made out of a trade kettle. So again, not only are Native Americans then and today very adept at traveling efficiently, using their resources efficiently, but recycling something me might want to take a lesson from tonight. Um, and uh, you have your kettle, your trade kettle that you've gotten from the French initially or the English later on. And it's blown out. It's got a hole, a big hole in it. It's not worth patching up. So what do you do? You can pass this around. Now. You can take that kettle, cut out the bottom, make cut out arrowheads, because now they're getting rid of the traditional stone arrowheads or projectile points, not only in that case, but also buying firearms later on. Um, you could make uh, a brass plate uh, to decorate your deceased, of which that occurred at Pemaquid that was found uh, a long time ago, um, and on and on and on. So items that are quite useful either for appearance or for daily use. Oh, and uh, before I forget, this is kind of, and lead shot, and they're actually, you can pass those around. These are, oh, I'll do it quickly here. Give me the lead shot. Believe it or not, lead shot and powder and firearms. This becomes a problem as relations deteriorate with the English by the 1670s. But up until then, that uh, was fairly common. Um, what I'm holding right here, I'll just show you a couple examples of musket balls. Um, some, well, not quite swan shot, various calibers. And these were utilized by Europeans and Native Americans in your firearms um, to shoot at game or at your enemies. Thanks a lot. And last but not least, you know that big guy there. The liquor trade became part of this fairly, thank you. Quickly, rum was the big, I uh, wouldn't say money maker, but trade item when it came to alcohol. And this created a real issue. Um, there were attempts on the part of within the tribal groups to control the amounts. They, they said, we still want some, but within moderation, they negotiated this in the 16 and 1700s, but it was the, one of the darker sides of the trade itself um, that, that played out throughout the century uh, and into the 18th century and beyond. This is a reproduction gin case bottle from the 1600s, but it's quite accurate. And I, mean, I found a number of these up at a site 
um, from the mouth of the river. So anyway, the beaver itself could have been used to, as we see here, make a hat. And that was all the rage from the mid, let's say 1560s until the, throughout much of the 1600s. So you've got this merchant over here, Orman Hines, it's done quite well as a fisherman. He wants to let folks know that he is doing pretty damn good. And there's many ways he can do it. He's got five shallop that are working for him and he's well appointed as we can see from these, oh, what Facing out here. Um, that beaver hat was actually found in Amsterdam Harbor, completely intact, which is pretty amazing. So, Orman, someday I may get one for you. One of one of our um, actually uh, historic interpreters, uh, unfortunately, he passed this past uh, winter, but he had a beaver hat identical to this one made and I got a shot of him. I wish I had brought it and he looked great in it. Um, yes, so quite so when you see that kelp pass around, this is with the I think the guard hairs. So the, the felting itself is a whole process unto itself. Um, and uh, there's a whole bunch of things that go into in that into making it whatever purposes. Where is the pelt? Jody, do you want to model for the audience here? Oh, come on. I will then. This is another place where they found it on people's shoulders. And then go stand in front of the camera. I'm sorry, audience. Here I am. Okay. Uh, if I was a little taller, it'd be easier. But anyway, um, so several purposes and a, an aesthetic statement to those that you work for you or around in the town. Okay, let's pick up speed here. And um, canoes, getting back to canoes themselves, um, as far as Native America goes, this is the way they are getting to places like Pemaquid or Winnegans over in modern day Booth Bay um, throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. And it's a little misleading here. This image here gives you some idea as to what you would have seen in New England, particularly northern New England, as far as Native American. Let's see here. Uh -uh. What did I? Uh, well, wrong one. Here we go. These represent a series of villages on the St. Lawrence River here. These are typically. Uh, Jesuit overseen. Um, and what we're looking at too is the fact that you're a lot of displacement by the time these folks are moving up here to get away from the English. Because at this point in time, particularly when you get in late 1600s, 1700s, you have a series beginning with uh, King Philip's War, King William's War that decimate further the Native American population and also encroachment on their territory. So they move to get away from these folks that are bothering them in one way or another. And then here we are. It's not Fort Pemaquid, but anyway, this would have been Fort Charles that we'll hear about briefly, and then Fort William Henry, the two 17th century forts, and then Fort Frederick in the 18th century. And then the St. George's River here, and on and on up the coast. And this is one way the English realized if we're gonna have this system work, we need to have a standard system of trade. What you get for two small, holes, two small holes, one beaver skin in season. Out of season, the beaver's not worth as much. And it goes on and on and on. So this would have been posted in each of these truck houses or trading posts that you would have seen typically if they were on the up and up. If they weren't, something might be amiss. You could, and there were traders that were uh, not to be trusted. The system worked decently is the best I can say. There were efforts on the part of the English to standardize it and to make it work better. 
because they benefited from that. They're trying to win over the uh, Wabnaki to their side away from the French so that they can give them cheaper goods and more of them and they treat them decently uh, as, as trading partners, that would improve the, the situation, but it didn't always work that way. These are a number of items that I found on a site uh, upriver, uh, basically uh, a mile upriver from where a colonial Pemaquid is today. This site dates to around 1630. Um, and let's see. These two guys here, oh, and this guy here is one of those cloth seals I was referring to earlier. You have, and I never was able to figure out what this um, ensign or design here was referring to. Either it probably was the maker's mark of the, uh, the merchant that, that was selling that or had purchased that uh, textile. A mouth harp made out of brass and some glass beads. And then a redware elbow pipe. This is, these are all 17th century. Um, I found clay smoking pipes there that go back to around 1630, two of them uh, definitely, which is pretty, pretty exciting. So by the time, as I said earlier, that we started having things falling apart um, throughout the coast, it starts down in Southern New England with Kingfield's War uh, breaking out between uh, Mass Bay, Plymouth uh, and the Wampanoag and Narragansett. And it works its way up in a somewhat different, but they, they do hear of warfare down south. So it's not directly related, but there's a spinoff of that. And that continues in Northern New England from 1675 until 78. And with bad consequences for both parties. Pemaquid is burnt in 1676. And we are right, right there. It was the peninsula tip right there, Monhegan. Okay, so interesting enough. How did the people get off of Mon uh, Pemaquid and Monhegan? They grabbed whatever they could grab. Now we're getting back to maritime. They initially, they go sail over to Damaris Cove, but there's a problem with that. It's only three miles offshore. Native Americans are not necessarily good swimmers, but they're good sailors. And they soon say, you know, this is not a great place to be. Um, they're either over there in their canoes, which they easily could have done, or they may have actually uh, gotten hold of some uh, shallops and sailed over there. So where do they go? They go to Monhegan. They hang out there for two weeks or so. And upwards, the, the population has exploded at that point in time because you're basically taking most of the population that didn't leave in, in the attacks or weren't killed on Monhegan which is not exactly a, a place that's of fruit and honey as far as uh, you know, being farming and good, good water, et cetera. Um, hopefully I didn't offend anybody that, that's wanting a special place in their heart. I love it too, but anyway. So um, they lasted there for two weeks and the same issue. They were concerned about being attacked by water. And so they hit the road and they sail. A lot of these refugees sail down in shallops, pinnaces, whatever you could snag, sloops, down to Boston and the North Shore. That's the end of the story. Or is it? So, about eight months pass. And in that time, we have New York starting to get involved in the picture here, even though Massachusetts still lays claim to it, um, this, this chunk of land. It's no longer a private proprietorship. It's now owned by the province of Massachusetts, the Dominion of New England, eventually. And what we're looking at is a new addition to Pemaquid. We now have a wooden palisaded fortification that's manned initially by uh, reg uh, English regulars, uh, upwards about 50 guys and English officers. And they're um, commanding this fort and the troops off and on throughout the 12 years that the folks are here. So this is the first presence on what was a portage point. Remember we talked about that portage from New Harbor to the mouth of Pemaquid River? Now, this is roughly where we think that glacial erratic would have been. 
because we know that when they attacked again in 1689, they used the rock to shelter there. This fort now is blocking access to the indigenous portage point. So that was not a mistake, even though they're still trying to have decent relations, a way to sort of control the Native Americans' access, movement, et cetera. And the Native Americans, when Fort, uh, Fort Charles is here and when Fort William Henry that's built about, uh, well, 1692, it bugs them because now they uh, cannot travel here without getting nervous and being afraid of being harassed or shot at or whatever because they are hunting for deer in the area and traveling with their canoes. So a new issue. This fort also was a point of uh, meeting with the English to uh, negotiate, to trade. So it was not just a conflict point throughout the 12 years that it stood there, along with the newly established village. Um, we have never found evidence that we can pinpoint to it, but there was a, backing up for a second here, you can't see it here, but outside the fort was a road that would have extended up on what I refer to now as a Snowball Hill Road, um, not that exact route. They talk about truck houses or trading posts on both sides of that road, but they were set to be situated that they could not block the vantage point of the garrison itself um, because they're concerned about security. And also Native Americans were not allowed to get inside the fort technically. Uh, to trade. They could outside the fort. So there's some restrictions that are now occurring. So as far as waterborne transport, there's a, a bunch of neat references. I'm not going to give all of them, but in six, uh, August of 1677, there's a major meeting between these new newcomers, the New Yorkers, um, and then some merchants from Portsmouth and uh, Boston. And in that, there's a document that was written up by uh, Joshua Scottow, who is a major merchant, originally based in Boston, and later on he set, settles up on the southern coast of Maine. And anyway, he's at this particular meeting at Pemaquid at Fort Charles. And just some excerpts. We sailed from Boston. This is, uh, as I said, early August, 1677. We sailed from Boston ye afternoon, came up with Black Point in ye, ye morning early, saw three shallops who ran from us, about four o'clock, meaning they were, they were afraid that these guys were going to harass them. They could have been French. We don't know, but nonetheless. And he goes on. Uh, afternoon came up with Seguin, saw a catch or a catch, as he spells it, another uh, decked vessel. Uh, took her for an enemy and provided accordingly. Came into Pemigwood about nine o'clock that night. Then he goes on, he sees a sloop. Eventually, he makes reference to 13 canoes coming from Winnegans, which is Booth Bay. And this is where the natives are coming to meet to basically do business with the English, to see who these guys are, what are their intents, can we get along with them or whatnot. But what I'm pointing out here, and I'm going to wrap it up, is that we're now starting to see more and more of what's there as far as fishing vessels, transportation, military vessels, um, and also references to English using the birch bark canoe. I only have two references that I have right now, but these are not the only ones out there. It's, these are Pemaquid, well, Midcoast specific. One takes place in 1695. So Fort Charles at this point and the Pemaquid settlement has been burnt down. They set up a new fort on the, uh, roughly in the same general area that's now made out of stone. That's there for four years from 1692 to 96. 1695, two guys are out in the, the sound. It's probably the outer harbor or beyond heading towards John's Island. And it's not gonna help you here seeing that, but um, their small birchen canoe in March, 1695 is overturned in a basically a freshet. Blows them over and they're gone, they're dead. Um, so one tells us something about life on the frontier, in this case, you were not having just to worry, and I point that out in our the exhibit we have up there. It wasn't just worrying about being shot up uh, or scalped or whatever. 
when it came to French or Native Americans, but also just the weather itself could do you in. Uh, and there are undoubtedly were more people. The other reference I can give you is a, a favorite guy of mine, John Giles, who I've been studying for about 30 years, who was um, a Pemaquid resident uh, up until his 10th birthday. He was captured in the 1689 raid. And then for the next almost nine years, he was a captive traveling all over the interior of Maine and the North Woods into New Brunswick, McDuckduck, et cetera. He comes out with this experience speaking two Algonquian dialects and French. But he also picked up a lot of woodcraft, surviving in the woods. He loses two toes in the woods and, and while one hunting expedition he goes on. He's, I know he's canoeing. 1717, he's in Arousic at a secondary major uh, negotiations between Wabnaki, I think uh, Penobscot, Narawat, Orange Walk, et cetera. He's there as an interpreter. The governor of Massachusetts tells him to go and uh, meet with, and I've forgotten now who, uh, and he takes off in his birch bark canoe. The closing point as far as maritime craft to show you this now overlap, this exchange of cultural items, not just trade goods, but well, the, uh, the canoe was one too, is um, this same Arousic meeting in 1717, the English Mass Bay are trying to impress the Wabanaki diplomats. So what do they do? They sail up this man of war, up the river, lots of fanfare. She fires a couple of guns off, she runs aground. It takes them like a, two days or a day and a half to get the, sh the, the ship off the rocks while the Wabanaki are there probably going, you know, look at these idiots, what the hell they think. So that gives you a little bit of idea as to the extreme that where you have this powerful military, Navy, Army, et cetera, and they kind of, Ukraine, Russia, yeah. hopefully I'm not offending anybody here, but... Uh, Anyway, um, so you have that, but you have this exchange. It's another part of this whole exchange process. Not only language that people are exchanging in trade, and I know that was going on at Pemaquid and at many of other places, but you're exchanging everyday small goods, clothing. The attack force that uh, attacks Pemaquid in 1696, the Wabanaki are wearing tricorn, hats, wigs, and um, feathers to identify them, just to give you a little sample, again, of what is going on. So without further ado, I'll, I'll leave uh, you with that uh, passing note. There's plenty more to talk about that I could talk about, but I've already gone over. So thank you for your rapt attention and your interest. Very good question. Did stripping the birch bark off the trees kill them? Yes. and. Um, to take that a step further, not that they're killing them, but they live on as a canoe. Um, I, I've seen some pictures of, of Steve Kayard uh, and others, and he's like a mountain goat, um, will climb up with a belt up the birch bark tree, 20 feet up, and basically belly button up and down with probably a crooked knife slit that open and then you peel it very carefully peel You're not it on back. camera anymore oh, thank you sorry about that you want to make sure that you are not breaking it up you're going to typically have to do it in more than one section but you're trying to get as big a piece of the birch bark as you can because the more pieces you have the more you have to sew together um so that's sort of a long-winded answer to your initial good question um i mean for that matter and i'm sure there was probably a, a process a religious process, uh, 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 because I think about hunting. Indigenous folks then and now still will honor the deer, the bear, and other things that they hunt um, because it's part of their natural world that they respect, something that we at times have lost uh, sight of. But anyway, any other questions? Yes, any other questions? Oh, yes, in the back, Jim Nelson. Yeah, um, when did rum uh, first start becoming a trade good in this part of the world? 
Good question. I can't give you an exact answer, but definitely 17th century, if I were to guess, and I should know better about that. Um, probably by uh, the second half, early second half of the 1600s, you have other things, but that was the, it was cheaper, but it was more devastating. Aqua vitae or gin uh, eventually comes in. You get other things like brandy in the 18th century. So a good question. And that brings up a great point because I happened to, when I was looking um, last March uh, over at the Booth Bay uh, Historical Society, which if you have a chance, it's, it's got an amazing collection of stuff. And I was uh, another project looking at indigenous uh, summer travelers, um, that's my term, um, from 1870 to 1970s. And anyway, um, I looked at a lot of basketry or whatever that Wabnaki Penobscot that was there on display. But they also had a number of nautical charts from like the 1860s. And so this is just because it's not 17th century or 18th century, you can find a lot of as and your first name again, Rob, Rob. Um, has pointed out here, and I'll reemphasize that you get a lot of carryover into the 19th and early 20th century, thanks to families that now are dead and gone or moved away. And that's sort of the sad part is the oral tradition still there, but it's fading because so many people aren't here anymore that, that were here in, let's say, the 1920s or 30s. Um, but those charts are gr a great resource to reconstruct what the world was naturally and culturally. Good. Thank you, uh, Neil. Before I let you, you all go, I'd like to bring Kirsty back up again to talk about next week's program. Or, or, or some other, things. other programs. Other things. So uh, first of all, just thank you again to our speaker tonight. Um, and how do you say your last name? Pauly. De Pauli, Neil De Pauli, uh, and to our audience, thank you so much for coming um, both here and abroad. 